and welcome Professor Stone. It's good to have you here. Uh, Professor Stone, Jeffrey R. Stone, is one of the country's leading authorities on the First Amendment. He's a scholar, he's an accomplished educator and administrator, and a prolific writer. He was the dean of the University of Chicago Law School and now serves as the Edward H. Levi Distinguished Service Professor of Law at the University of Chicago. He was the provost at the University of Chicago for eight years. He writes regularly for the Huffington Post and writes op-ed columns for major daily newspapers. He's written several books about the government's effort to limit freedoms during periods of crisis and wartime. He won the Robert F. Kennedy Award in 2004 for his book, Perilous Times, Free Speech in Wartime from the Sedition Act of 1798 to the War on Terrorism. Professor Stone will be speaking at the law school today at 1245 on same-sex marriages, and it's free, and I encourage you all to attend. It's an honor to have you here, Professor Stone. Thank you. I'm delighted to be here. And you were telling me this is your first visit to the Ole Miss campus. Yes, it is. Well, we're glad you're here, and I hope you get a good uh, insight into Ole Miss. Very much so. Um, there's so many things going on with the First Amendment. All you have to do is pick up the uh, newspaper and see uh, challenges to the First Amendment every day. You study this, and I thought uh, with all the things going on, we ought to start right here with college campuses. Mm -hmm. I know you've looked at this, you've seen it from several different perspectives, but what is it? Uh, why do you suppose there are these threats today to the First Amendment on college campuses? where uh, students seem to feel they should be free of any uncomfortable speech, and administrators are rallying to put in speech codes, all of which fly in the face of the First Amendment. Tell us, help us understand the problem. So, it's the, 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 as you describe it, it's accurate. The problem is something that has arisen in the last three or four or five years. Um, largely unprecedented in the sense that the desire for uh, censorship is driven um, by students. Um, that's the part of it that's, that's unprecedented. Um, colleges and universities have always uh, had to, to struggle to maintain and to preserve um, academic freedom. And uh, this was true uh, from the very beginning of colleges and universities in the United States, which were then uh, very much controlled by religious leaders and who determined what views could and could not be expressed and anything that was said that was incompatible with the views of the moral leaders of an institution was um, prohibited. Uh, and then later, for example, in World War I, there were extraordinary efforts to excise from university campuses any speech that was critical of the war or the draft. Uh, during the McCarthy era, uh, it was impossible to have any uh, expression that was deemed um, sympathetic to um, communism or the ideas underlying communism. Uh, and now what we're seeing is this political correctness, which is, again, similar to these other movements in the sense that there's a powerful demand to censor views that are seen as wrong or inappropriate. But the key difference is this is being driven by students. It's always been the case that students were the champions of free speech. They were the ones who basically argued, along with faculty members in most instances, that they should be allowed to hear the ideas, uh, speak the ideas that they thought were interesting and worth hearing, regardless of whether they offended or upset other people. Um, so the question is, what's caused this dynamic, right? And the, the most common explanation, and the one I think carries a lot of weight, frankly, um, is that we're dealing now with a generation uh, that was raised uh, differently from most of their predecessors. Um, we're dealing now with a generation of young students um, who, to use the cliche, uh, were often raised by helicopter parents, um, by people who basically protected them, uh, rewarded them, valued them, uh, and esteemed them in ways that essentially shielded them from criticism, from frustration, from challenge, from defeat. Uh, and they're now confronting an environment that's more demanding and more challenging and, and more upsetting than what they used to. And in some sense, the one theory is that they simply don't have the, the, the personal reserve um, to deal with that kind of discomfort and 
dis disagreeable uh, 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 ideas um, that their predecessors had. And they're therefore much more upset by this uh, than, they, than they should be. And to the extent that's the issue, uh, it does seem to me that, that one of the core functions of university is to prepare our students to be effective citizens in the real world. And that to the extent what we're experiencing now is a generation of students who are thin-skinned uh, about being upset, uh, that it's our job to get them over that and to prepare them, in fact, for a real world that will not protect them from these types of uh, ideas and, and expression, um, and to give them the strength uh, to argue back, to defend their positions, uh, to hear things they don't like, and to be, in that way, effective citizens. Um, there's another element to it, though, that's worth mentioning, and that's that um, it may also be true that part of this is exacerbated by the fact that um, it, it's possible students in the past, um, particularly students who are members of minority groups um, or other groups that have been uh, seen as uh, vulnerable and less than fully welcome on college campuses, um, in the past that they may have experienced the same sense of alienation and abuse, but they were silenced. And they were silenced because they felt intimidated and they felt unwelcome and uncomfortable and marginalized. And that a different spin on this is that this generation of students actually has the courage to speak up and to, and to say that they are feeling this set of emotions that their predecessors were afraid to talk about. And viewed in that sense, one can actually see this as a positive development in the sense that if we've had students feeling this all along, and we were oblivious to it, then that's not a good thing. Because it denies us the ability to actually address that problem and to help those students overcome these feelings. So I, my guess is it's a combination of these two factors, but it does pose a serious challenge to universities to figure out how to address this issue and also how to do our best job possible of preparing our students to be, as you say, effective citizens in the future. Well, let's take that from the general to specific. And you wrote uh, recently about this, uh, that students should have the right to wear, say, Halloween costumes that might offend some people. Uh, and you wrote, for example, wearing sombreros or blackface or dressing as aborted fetuses. You wrote, the robust freedom of speech that must be guaranteed by a university must include the freedom to express thoughts, opinions, and views that others find odious, hateful, distasteful, and offensive. However offensive such speech might be to others, it is clearly a part of the freedom of expression we must all tolerate. You want to explain that in terms of specifics? Sombreros, blackface? Sure. So one of the fundamental precepts of freedom of speech um, which it took us a long time to figure out, frankly, is that if you open the door to censorship because you think you know what's, what ideas are good or right or appropriate, then you open the door to others to make the same claim. And you may think, well, they're wrong. I was right, you're wrong. The views I think should be censored should be censored. The views you want to censor shouldn't be censored. But one of the things we've learned is you can't, that doesn't work. Is that once you authorize and empower officials to engage in censorship, you completely lose control of what does get centered, censored in the long run. And it's particularly problematic, I think, for this moment, because the, the, the groups and individuals who are calling for censorship in this context are generally relatively marginalized minority groups who themselves in our society are going to wind up being disadvantaged in a world in which censorship is permitted. Because in the long run, they're the ones who are going to get censored. And so the simple fact that it, it, it took the Supreme Court half a century to figure out is the only way to have a robust system of academic freedom or freedom of expression is to recognize that I don't get to censor the ideas that I loathe because I don't want someone else to censor my ideas that they loathe. 
Um, and that's painful for anybody who doesn't like the ideas being expressed, whether it's communism or whether it's criticism of a war that is seen as unpatriotic, uh, or whether it's criticism of religion, um, or whether it's criticism of a race, or, or it's, it's uh, arguments against climate change. It makes no difference. The point is that you, you can't get to pick and choose. Because you know, if, I were the, if I were the the czar forever, and I was the only one who would get to decide what gets censored, yeah, I like that. I'd be happy to do that. But there is no czar. The czar is whoever gets control at any given point in time. And keeping that door closed is the only way to guarantee a full and robust freedom of expression for everyone. Um, so that's, that's a key part of the, of the explanation. Um, and, and frankly, the, the, those who want to censor particular expression now are viewed from this perspective no different from those who wanted to censor free expression before. Um, and those who wanted to stifle advocacy of communism, and those who wanted to ad, uh, stifle advocacy of criticism of the war, um, it's basically the same thing. Uh, they think that speech is wrongheaded, it's dangerous, it's harmful, um, it endangers the nation. You can't have one without the other. Um, the, the other point I want to make is, is that one thing one could say is, OK, you can, you can advocate ideas, but you can't advocate ideas in certain ways. So the sombrero or the blackface or the aborted fetus or whatever, um, you can criticize abortion, but you can't have aborted fetuses, right? Um, you, can, uh, you can advocate uh, views that are anti-Semitic, but you can't have swastikas. But again, one of the things the Supreme Court has well recognized is that a core part of freedom of expression is to basically offend. That one of the ways that one can be effective in expression is to get people's attention to get them to listen to you. And one of the effective ways of doing that is to do speech that is offensive. And therefore, although there is a difference between restricting ideas and restricting means of expressing those ideas, um, we have to be careful not to be casual about ruling out the, um, the means of expression as well as the ideas. And then let me say that tolerating speech you don't like doesn't mean you like it, doesn't mean you respect it. Saying the Nazis can march in Skokie doesn't mean you like Nazi ideas. Saying that people can be racist or anti-Semitic or anti-Muslim uh, or anti-abortion or anti-gay doesn't mean you happen to agree with any of those ideas. It means that the response is to say why they're wrong and to engage in that discourse and to explain why those ideas are hateful and why they should be rejected and turn it into a debate in which hopefully you win and that people listen to the ideas, decide you're right, and move on. But it's not to silence the ideas in the first place. You might uh, well understand that here at Ole Miss, the administration and faculty and most of the students are very sensitive to the racist past that has existed here at this university and within this state. And so um, anything that uh, tinges toward even the appearance of racism is met very quickly, and probably most of us would say appropriately, with some show of uh, disdain or, or maybe what you might even call force. And to codify that, uh, and I'd like to uh, examine this in light of the First Amendment, uh, your views on the First Amendment, Ole Miss has adopted a creed that all students uh, subscribe to when they uh, uh, come to the university is an effort to provide an umbrella of how do you navigate this area of freedom and what could be seen as racism or other signs of odious activity. So I'm going to read the Ole Miss Creed. It's not that long. And I'd like you to react to it in light of your First Amendment values. The University of Mississippi is a community of learning dedicated to nurturing excellence in intellectual inquiry and personal character in an open and diverse environment. As a voluntary member of this community, I believe in respect for the dignity of each person. I believe in fairness and civility. I believe in personal and professional integrity. I believe in academic honesty. I believe in academic freedom. I believe in good stewardship of our resources. I pledge to uphold these values 
and encourage others to follow my example. This creed has been used to discipline or to uh, uh, react against things that might appear to be racist. Your view about that? Well, I would not um, require my students or faculty to accept a creed like that. Um, I don't think a university should insist that its members believe anything. Um, they should be perfectly free to reject every one of those things and to argue why they're wrong. Um, and I have to say, the idea that, that to be a member of this community, and I didn't know about the creed before, but to be a member of this or any academic community, that you're required to pledge agreement with a set of values and beliefs that are kind of ideological, frankly, um, I find that problematic. I, I have no problem with the university encouraging people to have those values and educating people to have the values that the university thinks are, are appropriate. But to require it as a condition, in effect, of being a member of the community seems to me incompatible with academic freedom. I think it's an indication of uh, our defensiveness about our racist past. No, I, I think you know, one of the things a university like Mississippi can do, if it wants to address that, um, is to have um, memorials that acknowledge and condemn its racist past, that basically show this is who this state was, and this is not who we are today, and we are embarrassed and reject the policies and values and institutions that once existed here. And I think that that's an important way of telling the community that um, we aren't that anymore. Not silencing people who make, want to make arguments today. I don't think that's an appropriate response. But I do think that for the university to take a position in the same way that it celebrates certain things, it can also say we don't celebrate this about what we've done in the past, either as a university or as a state. And I think that's a way of, of um, affecting the set of attitudes and values and the sense of belonging that people have um, without silencing anyone. So I, I, would, I would personally see that as a much more appropriate and powerful way of assuring people that we really are committed to these values. Mm -hmm. We're going to have a conversation here in a minute with some of the students here, so we may hear more from them about this subject. Uh, the big news, as you probably know, in Mississippi last week was passage of a law that Governor Phil Bryant said protect, protected the religious freedom of Mississippi citizens. The law allows circuit clerks, faith-based organizations, and businesses to refuse service to gay people and others based on their religious convictions. Any chance that you think this bill will pass constitutional challenge in the Supreme Court? Um, no, uh, mainly because it, it, it violates a simple precept, which is that if you're going to protect religious freedom, you have to protect it neutrally. So a bill that said that businesses and so on and so forth um, don't have to act in ways that are inconsistent with the individual's religious beliefs across the boards would be constitutional. But one that basically picks out certain specific religious beliefs and protects them, but not others, is clearly not constitutional. You can't do that. You've studied the Supreme Court. You're a leading authority on uh, the Supreme Court and the justices and their opinions. Were you surprised uh, when they uh, 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 reached the ruling to uh, uphold same-sex marriages? Well, I'll talk about this at, at length at, at, at the Matthews Lecture, but um, was I surprised at that time? No. I mean, I, by the time we got to that moment, uh, I would have said I was 90% confident that the court would rule the way it did. But if you'd asked me that question 15 years before, I would have said almost inconceivable. Right. Um, 
I read uh, one of your blogs that talked about what, where you thought the Supreme Court would be in 2025, mm -hmm. which is a bold thing for anybody to uh, even talk about, much less write about. Uh, give us your insight into where you see the Supreme Court going if the Democrats win and if the Republicans win. So the court, since 1969, the Supreme Court has been dominated by conservatives. Um, when Richard Nixon got to appoint four justices, um, basically within a year, uh, it transformed the Supreme Court. And ever since then, it's moved more or less consistently to the right. Um, and despite that, the court is basically divided 5-4 on most issues. Um, there are four what I would describe as moderate liberal justices. It, before Justice Scalia died, there were four pretty conservative justices. And then you had Justice Kennedy, who's, who's a moderate conservative. And um, before that, you had Justice O'Connor, who was the swing vote. And she was a little bit more on the moderate side than Kennedy. Um, but the fact is that Kennedy, in about a quarter of the cases, um, a quarter of the, of the controversial cases, um, votes with the liberals. And about three quarters of the time, he votes with the conservatives. Um, if, if Merrick Garland, President Obama's nominee to replace Justice Scalia, were confirmed, um, it would move the court further um, in the, in the, to, toward the left. Um, because Garland is a very moderate progressive, it wouldn't move it radically to the left. Um, but it would pretty much move it back to where it was 10 years ago. So 10 years ago, um, when Justice O'Connor was the swing vote, and after she retired, Justice Alito replaced her, and Justice Alito was much more conservative, um, and that meant Justice Kennedy became the swing vote. So basically, we moved the court back to where it was about 10 years ago. But the question you're asking is different. Let's, let's take the, the more extreme example. Suppose that the, the Republicans in the Senate refused to confirm Judge Garland, which I think, by the way, is a complete violation of their constitutional responsibilities. Um, but suppose they do that. And suppose a Republican is elected in the 2016 election. What would be the difference in the Supreme Court between those two courts? Right? Well, it would basically be the difference between, well, first of all, it depends on who the, the new president appointed. But presumably, it would be someone to the, to the right of Anthony Kennedy. So it would, put, it would leave the court basically where it was before. It would be the exact same court for all practical purposes before Justice Scalia died. Right? So the difference there would be between a court that is exactly like the one that existed before to one that is a bit more moderate. So what would that mean on what issues? So given that, that, that um, uh, Merrick Garland is, and I know Merrick Garland well, he's a, uh, someone I've known for 30 years, um, given that he's basically a pretty moderate guy, both in his views and especially in his kind of willingness to upset the apple cart. I mean, he's not somebody who will go around overruling things right and left. Um, my guess is that most of the key precedents that have been established uh, would be left largely intact. That's on campaign finance, on affirmative action, on, um, on the Voting Rights Act, uh, and on guns. Um, you know, if Garland were writing on a clean slate, he probably would not agree with most of those decisions. But my guess is he wouldn't vote to overrule them. Uh, so, so my sense is it wouldn't be a radical change from the current state of affairs. As new issues come up in the future, the court would be more liberal than it would be with the Justice Scalia still on the court. Um, and, 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 it's, and it's a significant difference. I mean, I think that it matters. I understand why the Republicans are upset about going from a Scalia to a Garland, although I think they're exaggerating how much difference there would be. Um, but it's important to note that um, since 1968, there have been 16 justices confirmed on the Supreme Court. Um, eight of them changed the court significantly ideologically. The other eight were basically replacing people who were similar to what they were. But eight of them clearly replaced justices who were very different from them ideologically. Every one of those eight was appointed by a Republican president and confirmed by a Democratic Senate. And that includes Warren Burger replacing Earl Warren, and David Souter replacing William Brennan, and Clarence Thomas replacing Thurgood Marshall. Those all move the court sharply to the right. And we, this has happened eight times in the last 40-some years. And this is the first time 
there's been a nomination that would actually move the court somewhat to the left, and, and this big fuss is being made. And that's unconscionable, frankly. So given the moderation of Judge Garland, relatively speaking, if, uh, say, the Democrats win in November, do you think the Republican Senate then would attempt to confirm Judge Garland? Interesting question. Um, I would hope they would hope they would try to confirm Judge Garland in the sense that if they don't do that, then they're going to say we're not going to confirm anybody for the next four years, which would be way beyond unconscionable. But from their standpoint, Merrick Garland is a great outcome because he's very moderate and he's 63 years old. Nobody appoints 63-year-old justices. President Obama was making already a huge concession to the Republicans in choosing Garland. I mean, if you made a list of the very plausible nominees that Obama would have considered, um, Garland was by far the oldest and by far the most moderate. And he did that because Obama wanted to get this through, wanted to get it done, didn't want it to be controversial. Um, and uh, so if a Democrat is elected president in November, the Republicans presumably would leap to confirm Merrick Garland, because that's by far the best case scenario for them. Whether Garland would then, my guess is what would happen is that Garland would then go to, let's say, Hillary Clinton and say, you know, I'm happy to withdraw in this circumstance. And I don't know what Clinton would decide in that, in that situation. Clearly, if, 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 if Scalia had died um, after November, the nominee that Clinton would put forth, or any Democratic president would put forth, would be much younger and much more liberal than Merrick Garland. So yeah, the Republicans should leap to confirm Garland the day after the election if the Democrats mm -hmm. win. Right. You mentioned uh, President Obama a few times. Uh, you obviously know him. He taught constitutional law at the University of Chicago. Describe your relationship with President Obama. So I actually brought um, Obama to the University of Chicago Law School um, back when I was dean of the law school and he was a student at Harvard Law School. Um, so he came to Chicago as a law and government fellow immediately upon graduating from Harvard. And so I've known him for 25 years. Um, and uh, he taught at Chicago for about a dozen years, uh, not as a member, full-time member of the faculty, but as a, a part-time lecturer. Uh, he was a terrific teacher. Um, he started off by teaching one course a year, and it was so successful that we added, made it two classes, and that continued to be successful. So by the end, he was teaching three courses a year, which I think is unprecedented for us in terms of a not full-time member of the faculty. Um, but he was an extremely good uh, professor. He taught um, uh, equal protection of the laws, and he taught um, employment discrimination, and I forget the third course, uh, but very highly regarded by his students. Um, I've been in touch with him occasionally um, over the years. Uh, he appointed me several years ago after the Edward Snowden revelations uh, to be on a five-member review group about on to, to, to review all of the NSA's surveillance programs and to make recommendations to him and to the, uh, the, the Congress about those programs. I mean, he was at the law school uh, at Chicago last week um, to give a, uh, a, a hour and a half talk to students uh, in which he discussed the Merrick Garland situation and then answered questions about a range of, of issues um, across the board. Um, so what's Obama like? I mean, Obama is extremely smart. Um, he has an incredible command of the issues. Um, I think maybe Bill Clinton is the only president I know of who has a, who ever had a similar command of the details of you know, all these. It's amazing to listen to. Um, and he's a very moderate person, despite how he's been portrayed. Uh, when, he was a, when he taught constitutional law, his views about the Warren Court, for example, where he thought the Warren Court went too far. Um, and he grew up in a different generation from, from me. Uh, and so his views on the court were much more restrained. Um, his views were that you know, a court should, should be um, active, but only in very specific and defined circumstances. So justices like Sotomayor and Kagan, who are um, moderate liberals, are kind of what I would expect Obama to be like. Uh, they're not William Douglases and William Brennans and, and Earl Warrens and, and um, uh, Abe Fortas's. They're not Thurgood Marshalls. They're much more moderate than that. Um, 
So th that's basically what he's like. He's a very thoughtful and reasonable person. And it's, just, it's been terribly distressing to me to see the way he's been portrayed. Because if you sat down and talked to him, you would, you would find he's a very thoughtful, reasonable person. I mean, he's not an ideologue in any way, never has been. Um, and it's just remarkable to see the way he's been characterized. And in the center of journalism, do you blame in part or in whole the press on that, the way he's been portrayed? Um, it's it, the press. I mean, it, it, what, the, the press is not what the press used to be. So the press used to be, if you go back 30 years, it was a kind of mainstream press of professional journalists who had a certain degree of responsibility in the way they covered issues. and. And they had views, and they, you know, they, they had editorials and so on. But today, the press is, it doesn't exist in that way. The press is what's on the internet. And it's endless cable channels. And they're highly ideological and extremely polarizing. And so it used to be the case that most people got their news and, and opinion from relatively mainstream sources. And now, most people probably get their news and information from much more ideologically based sources. And that inflames, on both the right and the left, it inflames people's views. Because if you hear only people who agree with you, and you don't really hear people on the other side very much, then it just, it just um, uh, exacerbates one's own positions. Um, and so I think uh, that's played a large role in this. And it's not just about Obama. It's about the polarization of American politics generally. And how would you rate President Obama on the First Amendment? Um, the one issue on which he's been criticized that I, I can think of in the First Amendment is in, in dealing with leaks. Mm -hmm. So um, Obama has been uh, pretty uh, firm about uh, trying to prevent and, and prosecuting leaks from the government. And, and the media have been not happy with him on that score. Um, beyond that, I think he's been fine. I don't think there's been any real issues. Uh, on that issue, I am I tend to be sympathetic to the president, um, particularly having spent the time I did working inside the national security world. Um, I came to appreciate how much harm can be done by these leaks um, in a way that I think the media tends to understate because they like the leaks. They like having the information. It's cool. Um, and uh, I, I think the problem today is it used to be that a leak was a piece of paper. It was very limited to how much you could actually conveyed to the, to the public. Now, given the technology, you can leak millions and tens of millions of documents with the push of a button. And therefore, the, the danger of, of leaks to national security is infinitely greater than it once was. So I think that leaks that could readily be tolerated in the past uh, are much less tolerable today. Uh, so I guess I understand where the administration is coming from. In being in clamping down more on leaks than than um, predecessors did, uh, so so in my sense, is I understand why the media doesn't like it, um, but when I look at the particular facts in the individual circumstances, I do understand why the government has taken the positions they have. Let's talk about that report that you helped write uh, after the about uh, the country's surveillance. Uh, there was a five-person group appointed, and you were one of them. Uh, I read uh, one commentator who said normally presidents look to name five yes men to give him what he wants. And either President Obama didn't name five yes men or the yes men forgot to say yes. <laughs> uh, in that report, you helped uh, uh, people understand the balance between uh, national security, surveillance, and private liberty. Could you help us understand what that balance is or should be? Sure. Um, in, the, in the past, and even today in, in the criminal context, one of the primary ways we try to keep ourselves safe, whether against criminals or against international uh, conflict, is by deterrence. This is as fundamental to the criminal law and to international relations. Right? We try to deter people from robbery, from murder, from rape, from attacking us um, by saying, you do this to us, we're going to get you. You're going to go to jail, we're going to execute you, we're going to bomb you, whatever. And that's the single most important way in which we try to keep ourselves safe. Um, in the current situation, 
of terrorism, there is virtually no role for deterrence. It's an extraordinary moment because the enemies are not a nation state. There's no one against whom to retaliate. If a group of terrorists attack the United States, as they did, for example, in 9-11, you can't bomb another nation. It's not like the Soviet Union or Nazi Germany or whatever. There's nobody to go after, right? And so the problem is the single most important way we keep ourselves safe is largely unavailable in the context of dealing with the, the, the current situation, which makes it extremely important to be able to anticipate attacks in advance and to prevent them from happening um, rather than trying to deter them because there's no deterrence possible. And the challenge of doing that is extraordinary because the people you're trying to, to prevent exist across the world uh, in basically small scattered groups operating in secrecy um, through an internet that enables them to communicate with one another across nations and continents um, instantly um, and to plan various kinds of uh, actions and attacks that uh, can be quite dangerous, not only the kind of things that happened in 9-11, but the possibility of biological, chemical, even nuclear attacks. Um, so after 9-11, um, uh, one of the people in the Bush administration uh, made a comment that I read about later, which I thought really was interesting. Um, and what he basically said is trying to keep the nation safe now is like being a goalie in a soccer game where the other side can score from any side, including from behind, where the players on the other side are invisible, where the ball is invisible, where if they score, 3,000 people will die, and you're the goalie. And all you have to go on is basically the movements of the, of the, of the, of the, of the, of the grass, and to try to discern from that where the ball is, where the other players are, and what you're supposed to do. And if you put yourself in that mindset, it's like, this is, <laughs> this is really hard, right? And one of the things I learned when I got inside this world, and I, I was appointed, I'm the National Advisory Council of the ACLU, I was appointed to be a kind of civil libertarian a voice within this five-member group, five group, and I came in very skeptical about the NSA, about the programs, about the need for these programs, and so on. Um, but one of the things I learned is that the threats are very real, and that uh, the challenge of prevent prevention is extraordinary, and that this analogy of the soccer game is actually pretty apt, um, and that the people who are working to prevent these attacks feel this profound responsibility of, if I fail, thousands of people will die. And so the, the, what, what we came to was basically, as a group, what we came to was recognizing that we do need to do these things. It is really critical to do these things. Um, not only from the standpoint of saving lives, but also from the standpoint of saving our own civil liberties. Because if we are attacked, particularly repeatedly, then our civil liberties are gonna go out the door. Because we will then say we can't afford to have Fourth Amendment protections, we can't afford to have First Amendment protections, we gotta keep ourselves safe, and we gotta go into, into um, wartime mode. And so one of the reasons it's critical to prevent these attacks is not only saving lives, but it's also to actually preserve the very civil liberties that are, that are at issue. So but where I came away from this is basically saying um, we have to take seriously the, the claim that the need to engage in surveillance is real, that the potential, potential benef benefit of it is real, but at the same time, we have to recognize that the people who are doing these programs are going to err largely on the side of overreach. That is, because they are so focused on the danger of failure, they will err too much on the side of surveillance rather than restraint. And therefore, what's needed is to basically review all these programs on a regular basis and to constantly ask, how can they be refined? How can they be sharpened? How can we achieve the goals they're trying to achieve while minimizing to the greatest extent possible the intrusion on civil liberties? 
And so what we recommended in a number of respects was that programs that we felt actually served an important function um, needed to be uh, re-examined and needed to be uh, re retooled so as to add greater oversight, greater limitation, um, and a greater assurance that they couldn't be abused. Uh, and I think that's what largely needs to be done on a regular basis. But I have to say, I went into this having a great sense of, of skepticism about the, about the NSA in particular. Um, if you'd asked me before I began this, I would have said, um, the problem was the NSA has run amok. And it's doing all these programs without authorization, and the programs don't make any sense, and this is a disaster. And what I learned after being inside this world very intimately for, for a while um, was that the NSA actually is a pretty good institution um, with, a, with a high degree of responsibility. And that every one of the programs it engaged in was authorized by the Congress, by the executive, and by the judiciary. Um, and none of the programs it was engaging in, even the ones that were the most problematic, was the NSA doing things that were not authorized by all three branches of the federal government. The problem, and there were problems, was that the branches of the federal government were being sloppy. And they were authorizing things sometimes they shouldn't have authorized, and that should have been fine-tuned. So the thrust of our recommendations were basically that um, the, the essence of the programs were sound, but they were being administered in ways that were not nearly as careful as they should have been. So a simple example of this uh, I can give you is um, the Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Court is a secret court that is designed to oversee the use of these um, uh, top secret surveillance programs, um, which before the creation of, the, of this court operated without any judicial uh, oversight. Um, so when the NSA engages in these programs, it has to go to this Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Court for approval of its various activities. But one of the problems is the Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Court, unlike every other court in the country, only hears one side. So the government comes in and argues why this, this application of a program should be deemed legal, and the Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Court, which consists of regular federal judges, um, will decide. But there's no one advocating the civil liberty side. And the judges on the court say, we don't need that. You know, we know there's no one on the other side, so we take that into account. But we don't do that ever in our judicial system. It's an adversary system. And so one of the th things we recommended is there has to be a privacy and civil liberties advocate that uh, argues for that perspective every time that the, the court hears issues, that in raise issues about the scope of the government's authority. And that was accepted, and that was enacted into law by Congress. So there were lots of examples like that, where the programs themselves were sound, but they could be improved. Very good. Let's go to the audience for a couple of questions. Yes, sir. Um, my question was, uh, relates to the, what you were just talking about, about the FISA court. And, um, as a former member of the intelligence community, I'm very concerned about government surveillance of private American citizens and the effect that has of stifling <coughs> so my question is specific to law. What laws um, are uh, have to be renewed, if any, um, to establish whether how long the, the government can continue to collect information on private citizens' communications, and whether we should look at that as a permanent institution now, or whether that that is. <coughs> laws that regulate that have to be renewed and, and reviewed from a civil liberty standpoint like you were talking about. So all these law, laws <clears throat> that authorize these programs are time bound. So they all have to be renewed on a regular basis. Um, none, most laws are enacted and they just stay until somebody changes them. All of the laws authorizing um, a national security surveillance are typically three to six years and have to be renewed. So the Patriot Act, for example, just had to be renewed because um, it expired. And this is why all, one of the good things, that this is why all these laws have been enacted. And that's smart uh, for exactly the reasons that you suggest. Um, but the real question is, Congress does not itself have the tools, frankly, to evaluate the effectiveness or the abuse of these laws unless it has much more professional input than it tends to get. And one of the things I learned through this process is the, the members of our review group, there were 
five of us, and each of us brought a particular perspective and expertise. And two of the five members, uh, for me, who were the most valuable, were people who had spent their careers inside the, the, the security com community. And one of them, uh, Michael Morell, had been uh, acting director of the CIA and deputy director of the CIA for 15 years, and just left the organization. He knew inside and out how this world worked. And the other was Richard Clark, who'd been uh, in a series of administrations in as head of cybersecurity. And both of these guys understood who you can trust, who you can't trust, what questions to ask, um, how these programs actually operate. I knew nothing. Right? I was there because I had a perspective about free speech and, and privacy and history and, and so on. But the problem is, unless you have people like Morell and Clark helping you understand things, you can't understand them. And so we, we met frequently with the House and Senate Intelligence Committees. And the truth is, although they thought they understood things, they didn't. And this was really a problem. Because the, the entities in the government who were doing the oversight often don't have the professionalism that they need to enable them to do it well. So one thing I came away from is that there's a need for groups like this one to be uh, appointed on a regular basis to come in from outside and to evaluate with the charge that the president gave us. What the president told us is, look, I need to understand what we're doing right and what we're doing wrong. And I want you guys to be completely frank and completely direct and to say whatever you think. Um, and it'll be a public report, and that's, that's OK. Um, and he wanted a complete and candid and open evaluation. And that's what's needed. And it needs to be done by people who are really professional at doing that. And that's not so much me as much as it is people like Morell and Clark. Um, and and the, so the Congress can't oversee this. They don't have that expertise. And that's a real problem. Um, so, so I do think that, 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 that one of the dangers here is that unless you bring in that, that level of expertise, nobody really understands what's going on. They think they do, but they don't. We'll, ha we'll have to. Which gives you Donald Trump, you know, from a civil rights First Amendment point of view. I don't know that, that um, as we go forward, this has been institutionalized. And I must say, one of the things we didn't recommend on our report, we had 46 recommendations. One of the things we stupidly didn't recommend and didn't occur to us until we were done was this that there should be an annual or biannual review group like this one, with different people every time, um, constituted more or less similarly, with basically very distinguished, very experienced people to come in and give a free hand to go in and e examine everything and make a candid report and make recommendations. We did not recommend that, which was really, it was amazing to me that it didn't occur to us when we were doing it. A final question from the audience in the back. Well, I think Donald Trump has characterized himself um, as he is. Um, I mean, the difference, I think, is if you watch Obama as a president, you may agree or disagree with his views. That's fine. But he's not this crazy, rabid, left-wing character as he's been portrayed in some parts of the press. He's just not. Um, Trump is Trump. And I don't think the press has to portray him. People see him, right? And he's everywhere. Um, you know, it's sort of a standing joke. Every time you turn on CNN, the first th word you hear is Trump. Um, and uh, so I think the American people have a pretty good sense of, of who Donald Trump wants them to think he is, for better or worse. Um, whether that's actually who he is or not, I have no idea. I don't know Trump personally. Um, but I suspect this is who he is. Uh, and I do find it shocking and totally mystifying that so many people 
despite what he's, how he portrays himself, find him attractive. I don't get it. I really don't get it. Uh, yeah. Um, well, again, when you say without the backing of the media, I guess it's true that Trump doesn't have the backing of the media. Even, even the conservative media, for the most part, doesn't back Trump. Um, he has a microphone of the media. Excuse me? He has the microphone of the media. Right. He, right he become, he's become the media, right? The, the, the real failing, quote unquote, of the media here is that they, are, they have become so obsessed with Trump that he's on the air 10 times more than any other candidate. Right? And it's not, be I mean, why? Right? It's not because he's the best candidate or the wisest person. In, th in theory, they should be trying to have a sense of balance about the exposure they give to the different candidates. And if they were responsible, and this includes even the, respons the, the supposedly responsible media outlets, um, they should be trying to present these candidates to the American people in a way that, that doesn't completely distort the exposure that one candidate gets relative to another. That's extremely um, irresponsible if you're trying to fulfill a kind of mainstream function as the media, right? As, as CNN or, the, or the, the, the ABC, NBC, CBS networks are trying to do. Um, you know, if you're Fox News or MSNBC, that's different, right? Because they're just basically editorializing certain positions. But for the mainstream, what, I'm, what I call the mainstream media, you would expect them to consciously try to do this. Right? And yet they don't. They're just so completely um, uh, seduced by the fact that people seem to turn in, tune in when Trump is on, that that's what they want. They want viewers so they can sell advertising. Uh, so it's a fascinating. I, so I don't know of a single instance in, in the past that's been as dramatic as this one in this way. Uh, are there any other questions? Somebody wants to get in before I close with a question. Let's close with another question on the presidential campaign. We've seen on television a lot of disruptive protests during Trump rallies, and uh, the protesters being ceremoniously hauled out. Uh, uh, we may see a lot more of that in the general election, uh, the disruptive protest. Uh, help us understand the First Amendment aspect about what is permitted and what is not permitted in protest at a political rally. So. Acts that are disruptive of an event are not protected by the First Amendment, period. Um, if somebody goes into a movie theater and starts talking loud, they can be removed. It's no different if it's a political rally, frankly. Um, they have a right to be there if it's a public event, but they have no right to disrupt or obstruct the expressive actions of the people who are holding the event. That's not part of what the First Amendment protects. Um, they can protest outside the event to the extent that it doesn't disrupt traffic and other things that the, uh, the, the municipalities are allowed to address in a neutral way. Um, but there's no First Amendment right to obstruct or, or, or disrupt other people's speech. Um, that's not protected by the First Amendment, period. Because I mean, it's a neutral rule, it applies no matter who's speaking, no matter, no, it, so it, does, it doesn't mean you, can, it, you have a right to disrupt one person with another. It's a flat out neutral rule. You can't do things that prevent others from speaking and from communicating. That's that simple. And the First Amendment doesn't prohibit it. It's that the state is allowed to prohibit it if it wishes to do so. And the state should prohibit it, frankly. Um, and you know, on a college campus or in, in a political rally, if there are people who are preventing a speaker or whether it's Donald Trump or anybody else from speaking, and the audience who came to hear that speaker from hearing, they should be removed. Professor Stone, thank you for joining us today. My We've pleasure. learned a lot. Thank you. Thank you.